Welcome back to Project Kira. This is a collaborative speculative biology project that all takes place on the Project Kira Discord server. Last time, we finished taking a look at the status scene, Kira 30's Cambrian Explosion, establishing the main competitors in this game of life. Today, we will look at the colonization of land and see how each colonizer adapts to the extreme habitat of dry land. We start this journey once again talking about some abiotic factors. Boo, boring. I know, but stay with me. The subject of this talk is the continents, the stages and playgrounds for our evolution. For this project, we will be focusing on four major continents. Starting in no particular order, we have Terrestris, a northeastern continent that sits right above the continent of Liban. A unique thing about these two continents in this early stage is the transfusion of species, where due to the continent's closeness to one another, certain species will be able to cross over from one landmass to another. This essentially means that Liban and Terrestris' ecosystems will be very similar the closer you are to their shared coasts. Next is Unsclava. This is a mid-southern continent with a massive mountain range that makes up the majority of its southwestern coast. Also, before anyone says anything, no, it was not intentionally designed to look like Africa. Pure coincidence. Last but not least is Rakirin. This is a southern eastern continent that is heavily isolated. The Australia of Kira, if you will. And as for the many islands that you see marked around the map, they exist in this project to explore concepts or ideas that might not fit in with the rest of the world. This mimics the real world, where ecosystems and creatures form that are only unique to this island and can be found nowhere else on Earth. <coughs> Madagascar. <coughs> so now, we have been formally introduced to Kira's landmasses, and we can start exploring the colonizers of land. Well, not quite. We still have one unanswered question. Why would creatures colonize the land in the first place? This is an excellent question to ask, especially if the creatures in question don't have a means to survive. Many of the challenges to colonizing land right now include, but are not limited to, gravity, dehydration, and starvation, all of which lead to death. However, these challenges never stopped life on Earth from coming onto land countless individual times. Why is this? Well, this comes down to one simple answer, the lack of competition. As we covered the status scene and discovered the various ways for life to evolve, we saw many clades filling the various aquatic niches from the ocean very rapidly. This is a sentiment that holds true for the purpura as well as other alien clades on Akira. Land right now serves as a blank canvas for all future life. So, now that we know why creatures colonize land and what requirements need to be met, let's take a look at how the aliens of Akira solve these problems. Unfortunately for the aliens, a lack of food will most certainly deter them from colonization. But fret not, for we have an answer to this problem. This is Purpura rubusa, or purple bush. It stems from Purpura pedateriuma and is officially the first multicellular organism to make landfall. Reshaping the singular ancestral leaf allows it to be less likely damaged during a hypercane. Using the tough tissues of its body, they reach upwards to reach up out of the water, becoming something more recognizable as an earth-like plant. The reproductive organs have also moved up and out of the main body. They are now branching structures that have developed to help females of this clade to catch airborne male gametes. Once a female gamete is fertilized, the new offspring will be absorbed into the body for protection and resurface as a seed at the end of these branches. They will then drop into the water after a few days of development and will be carried to new locations around the world. Further specialization for land will befall this lineage of purpura with purpura herba or purple grass. Groups of purpura rubrusa will continue to specialize as the coastlines would become more and more populated driving individuals away from the ocean and more onto dry land. To better suit the environment that is now their homes, they became smaller in size, the tallest of which are 10 centimeters tall. The body of the purpura would go underground so as not to get damaged 
and their root systems would grow exponentially so that they may absorb as much water as possible. The reproduction method is very similar to that of their ancestors, where male gametes land on the female gametangium. Once the seed develops, it drops off and begins to grow as its own plant. And while this purple grass began to spread outwards, its siblings would be growing upwards. Meet purpura arbora, or purple tree. Branching off purpura rubusa, this clade of photosynthesizers reaches higher into the sky than any before it. They have developed a leafy crown on branches that adorn the top of these alien trees, retaining the ancestral leaf shape to once again avoid damage from hypercanes. The body is now tougher and stronger, supporting the grand sizes that these early alien trees reach. The reproductive system is found around the middle of the main body, forming what I'll dub a reproductive crown. These crowns are designed to catch male gametes. They are absorbed by female gametangium at the bottom of the crown, and then the zygote will be moved up the crown's branches and form into a seed. Once ready, they drop off and begin the great climb upwards. Now that we have the photosynthesizers settled, we can talk about the things that will eat them, namely the vermissa. One of the first vermis to make landfall was microvermissa, or small worm. Butting off the cancer vermissa, these tiny worms live in the coastal rainforests around the world. They are generalist omnivores, feeding on anything available, purpura or vermissa alike. As their name suggests, they fill the niche of microfauna. This was a role that they took due to their breathing method. Not having lungs restricts the potential size that they could reach. A similar situation can be found with the bugs on Earth. They are reduced in size compared to their ancestors, but share the same methods of locomotion as their aquatic counterparts, barely keeping themselves above the ground with a low scuttle. The reproductive gripping limbs that were once found on the Cancer Vermissa have all but vanished on the Microvermissa. They now reproduce by climbing onto each other to properly mate. After mating, fertilized female will lay several small round eggs into whatever medium they see fit. This ranges from leaf litter, hollowed out plants, and occasionally inside the corpses of other creatures. The female will then leave, abandoning the eggs. If all goes well, the eggs should hatch about a week after being laid. It's safe to say with their global populations and their generalist diet, they have the capacity to become one of the most diverse groups in all of Kira. Another descendant of Cancer Vermissa would take things a little different. Falsus oisa, or false bone, is a generalist herbivore found on Isla Steve. It lives in the forests of the islands and fills the niche of primary consumer. As you've probably already noticed, Falsus oisa has fused its body segments together to make one morphological unit. The extra bits of the exoskeleton have been restructured into an external spine and rib cage, hence its name. Their limbs have brought in with the front limbs also becoming longer. They have also developed some form of social behaviors. This is seen when they forge together and use distinct calls to find others of its kind. Said calls can also be used for attracting mates. Going from small to big, it's time to talk about the first predators of the New World. Crawling out of the ocean, a group of Gigantus vermissa have come looking for new opportunities. With their superior breathing methods, thanks to a proper lung-like organ, they grow rapidly in size and become the Perireptens vermissa, or land-crawling worm. These creatures inhabit the coastal rainforests of Terrestris, Liban, Unsclava, and Jacurin. They fill the niche of generalist omnivores and carnivores, having diets mostly consist of meat, but also having a few groups that switch to an omnivorous diet, feeding on most low-lying purpura, as well as any microvermissa they can catch. To better fit the new niche they inhabit, these creatures' legs have lost their exoskeleton armor and have become more muscular, being able to properly raise their bodies off the ground. They locomote in a similar fashion to that of earth scorpions and other insects. Their feeding antennae have elongated and developed two splitting muscular ends, acting like pincers to pick up food and bring it to their mouths. Their mandibles have also become much stronger to rip apart meat, allowing them more efficient chewing-like motions. 
Pteroreptans vermissa are easily some of the biggest aliens to arrive on land, with the largest species as big as a house cat. Having less competition has allowed for their segmented armor to become softer and lighter, allowing for easier locomotion in the pursuit of prey. Females of this group are often dull in coloration, appearing very light in pinks and purples. Males, on the other hand, are deeper in coloration, coming out in dark blues and purples. This clade is particularly notable for their sexual displays. Males will perform dances via shaking their tails. Once gravid, the females will lay their eggs in a small dugout burrow. But the vermissa aren't the only clades that seize the opportunity to take land for themselves. From the depths, a group of benthic scavengers find their way into shallower waters until they find the various coastal swamps of Terrestris, Liban, and Unsclava. From Emoa Patoa comes Pelucer Patoa, or Swamped Crawler. These creatures are amphibious generalists who feed on the purpura and microvermissa. They have developed a lung-like organ for proper intake of atmospheric oxygen. To support themselves on land, they develop an internal skeleton for better stability. Their eye stalks have moved to the top of their skulls. The mouths of these creatures have become more fit for feeding on tough vegetation or microvermissa. Many groups of Pelucer Pertoa are only about the size of earth frogs. They have a very permeable skin that allows for the easy transfer of water. This holds them back from fully separating from the water, needing to keep their skin damp at all times. Their skin itself is soft and moist to the touch, with their colors ranging from dark grays to pale purpley grays. Just like their dependency on water to stay moist, so too are their eggs reliant on the water to survive. These eggs are often laid at the bottom of swamps or slow-moving rivers. After a few months, the eggs will hatch. The young will have small fins that help them swim, but these fins are lost as they grow into adulthood. But of course, we can't end this video without going over the one creature who should crawl onto land. Back in episode 3, we covered the Armatus Procolpiscissa and Armatus Victusa. Thanks to these armed long fish, both these creatures have developed internal lungs that are fit for atmospheric respiration relatively quickly in Kira's development. And because the armed fakes have already primitive skeletons, it only seems right that they get a chance at this game of conquerors. Introducing the Armatus Patoa, or Armed Crawler. These grumpy little guys colonized the western and northern western of Liban, Isla Tanner and Isla Dietrich. Wandering the coastal rainforest, these aliens are omnivorous, filling the niche of semi-aquatic generalists. Armatus Pertoa have adapted by evolving less permeable skin to reduce water loss. They have also developed a moist, glossy, transparent layer of skin to help the eye from drying out. Their skeletons are adapted and altered to better now support the armed crawlers when on land. They have a low splayed out posture using their tails as a third point of contact. With the lack of prey items in the tiled zones and on land, they have adapted to eating both purpura herba and microvermissa. Armatus pertoa have pale blue purple hides. They retain a lighter bit of blue purple on their underside as leftover from their counter shading from their ancestors. Their heads, backs, and tails also retain the ancestral fins that now lie mostly flat along their bodies due to them not having any support. They also retain three digits at the end of each foot. When Armatus Pertoa came together to reproduce, both females and males released gametes through their mouths into a small shallow hole that is dug out by the females near coastal tidal zones. The gametes fertilize and then become eggs. Once they fertilize, the female will leave with the male bearing the eggs and then staying in the area for a few days before finally leaving. The eggs will then hatch about 60 Earth days later. Each time a pair reproduce, they have a clutch about around 300 eggs. So, our contenders are ready. The pieces are in place and the stage is set. The Terra scene begins strong, but how they evolve and diversify will have to wait for another time. Join me next episode as we look at the creatures of Terrestris and how they evolve in ways that could never have been predicted. 
Once again, none of this would have been possible without the people who contributed to the project. Sears, Harry Knight, and Galab Dab Dab for the details of Falsus Oasis. Thank you to you, the viewer. Y'all's support means a lot. And as of recording this, we have hit 500 subscribers. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to help further the project, a link to the Discord is in the description. Talents of all kind are welcome. If you want to see how the Vermissa diversify and prove their dominance over the land of Unsclava, we are hosting our second to last diversification event for one of the four major continents. Hope to see you there. Master Taxonomist, White Glove, out. Thank you.